This article discusses the long-term effects of COVID, which include post-acute COVID sequelae four weeks after the acute infection and long-term COVID effects, such as diffusion impairments, persistent fatigue, pulmonary fibrosis, dyspnea, and cough, and their distinction between acute infectious manifestations. This article organizes these effects by the different systems in the body, cardiovascular system, pulmonary system, hematological system, and nervous system based on current understanding. My name is Shreya Joshi, and I'm a medical student at the University of Nevada, Reno, and today I'm joined by my co-authors, Dr. Nikhil Vadi and Professor Christopher Chang. Hi, my name is Dr. Nikhil Vadi. I am a Southern Illinois University resident, uh, second year right now in the city of Decatur, Illinois. I'm Dr. Christopher Chang. I am the Chief of Immunology, Allergy, and Rheumatology at Memorial Healthcare System in Hollywood, Florida. Today, we're discussing our upcoming publication in the March 2022 edition of Mayo Clinic Proceedings titled Long-Term Effects of COVID-19. The takeaway of this article is that the effects of SARS-CoV-2 infection do not always end with acute infection. In all patients, monitoring of post-acute symptoms is important in order to recognize those that can develop long-term systemic damage. Rehabilitation in post-acute COVID-19 patients commenced as early as possible may lessen the effects that physical deconditioning and impaired lung function has on daily life. Emphasis on exercise after discharge should also be encouraged. Providers should also monitor for signs of malnourishment after acute COVID infection resolution. COVID-19 and its long-lasting sequelae have the potential to affect multiple body systems, which is another reason why everyone should be vaccinated and boosted. We decided to focus on long-term effects of COVID-19 because COVID-19 has been one of the deadliest pandemics in human history. Since its emergence in December 2019, the virus has spread across the world, infecting millions of people and leading to 5.5 million deaths as of January 16th, 2022. More and more research is being done on the virus to understand the effects it has on the human body, but not much is understood. The early research, including systematic reviews, has been heavily focused on the acute effects of infection. It has become quite clear in the recent months that there are clinical symptoms and abnormalities that extend beyond the period of acute infection. For many patients and their physicians, the prolonged complications of the virus and how long they may last is unknown. The major systems affected by COVID-19 are the lungs, the cardiovascular system, neurologic system, and the blood. The risk factors for prolonged pulmonary effects of COVID-19 include ICU admission, severe disease, high CT severity scores, increased levels of D-dimer and urine nitrogen, advanced age, and cigarette smoking. In one postmortem study in Italy, extensive alveolar damage was seen in 100% of the 41 samples and lung macro and microvascular thrombosis in 71% of individuals. In another study of 1,733 patients from China, those with more severe illness were more likely to have diffusion impairments and fatigue when compared to less severe patients. Odds for developing pulmonary fibrosis correlated with increased blood urine and nitrogen. The British Thoracic Society recommends that a post-discharge evaluation be done at four to six weeks and 12 weeks with follow-up imaging in high-risk patients. The use of dexamethasone six milligrams once daily for 10 days in patients hospitalized with respiratory distress in the recovery trial showed a reduction in mortality rates versus patients who did not receive steroids, but in many cases, a reduction of, in FEC and in interstitial lung disease can persist. Today, I'll be presenting the risk factors for persistent cardiovascular symptoms. These include severe disease, high viral load, pneumonia during hospitalization, increased troponin levels, and decreased and left ventricular ejection fraction as well as the use of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin administration during the acute phase of the disease. Effects on the heart include endothelial cell disruption, myocardial injury, chronic myocarditis, fibrofatty replacement in the heart, arrhythmias, and pericarditis. Increases in cardiac troponin may indicate an underlying cardiovascular pathway in COVID-19 that is correlated with increased severity of acute illness and use of mechanical ventilation. Pro-inflammatory cytokines are prognostic indicators of post-COVID-19 patients that may have cardiac sequelae due to cardiac fibrosis. Patients with pneumonia should be flagged for outpatient cardiac follow-up 
due to increased risk of cardiovascular disease, EKG, transthoracic echocardiogram, CRP, and troponin T, as well as pro-inflammatory markers should be measured in symptomatic patients. Because of risk of post-COVID-19 cardiovascular effects, athletes who have findings of myocarditis at the onset of the illness, such as dyspnea on exertion, chest pain, increased troponins, EKG abnormalities or arrhythmia should stop aerobic activity and athletic participation and should undergo an echo 24-hour halter monitor exercise EKG three to six months after the initial illness. In terms of neurological effects, a large retrospect cohort study found significant neuro and psychiatric morbidity in COVID-19 patients with severe illness. ICU admissions are associated with more neuropsych disorders and that risk increases with encephalopathy. Miss C patients also show high instances of neurological involvement. Difficulty smelling is a common complaint with mild COVID-19 that can last a variable amount of time. In addition, medications such as lopinavir, rotinavir, and corticosteroids have neurological side effects that can present during the acute infection or after the infection. Medical providers should screen for psychiatric disorders in patients who have been hospitalized due to COVID-19. Also, rarely autotoxicity is associated with lopinavir and rotinavir. Steroid use can lead to delivery and mood changes as well. The risk factors for persistent hematologic abnormalities include disease severity, length of the acute infection, ICU admission, low fibrinogen, elevated D-dimer on admission, D-dimer increment greater than 1.5, increased age, cancer, and corticosteroid use. Lymphocytopenia, thrombocytopenia, elevated CRP, and procalcitonin have been identified as markers of severe disease. Severely ill patients may have an increased risk for bleeding due to thrombocytopenia. Thromboembolic events that occur after an infection are usually immune-related rather than true thromboembolic events, suggesting that COVID-19 infection or the host response may somehow cause an imbalance in immune regulatory pathways. Acute illness severity and ICU admissions are risk factors for coagulopathy. Thromboprophylaxis should be considered for at-risk patients in the hospital and outpatient and those who have undergone prolonged steroid therapy. These findings relate to clinical practice and primary care physicians all over the United States due to the significant chronic issues that may develop in the respiratory system, cardiovascular system, neurological system, and hematological system. The effects of COVID-19 may last long beyond the pandemic timeline of this infection for many patients. It is of the utmost importance that clinicians are aware of post-COVID-19 sequelae and monitor patients that have been hospitalized or have had severe illness. Our findings show that COVID-19 has effects on the body that last well after the acute infection for many patients. This further emphasizes the need to be vaccinated in order to prevent the severe uh, COVID illnesses and reduce the extent of long-term sequelae in those patients. So um, the next step for this line of research will be to fully understand and study the complications that exist with varying severity of COVID-19. There's still many unknowns on how this disease will impact those affected in all age groups. For all systems, we still do not know if long-term post-COVID-19 effects will ever completely resolve. We also don't know the pathophysiology of long-term COVID effects. A better understanding of the reason why some patients develop severe disease and others may only have mild or asymptomatic disease, as well as the understanding of the biological reason for developing long-term effects will help us identify those who are at risk and possibly develop new treatments that can prevent or treat these long-term effects. Longitudinal studies are critical to help answer some of these questions. We encourage you to read our upcoming paper in Mayo Clinic Proceedings to get further details on this key issue. And we hope that this is informative to all clinicians and patients who chose to read this paper. We hope you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us 
Our home page is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you'll find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about Healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.